Growth hormone is a hormone that we all naturally secrete from our pituitary, which also resides near the roof of our mouth. The signal for the pituitary to release growth hormone arrives from neurons that exist in the hypothalamus. And then growth hormone impacts metabolism and growth of cells and tissues of the body. It is responsible for tissue repair as well. And the growth spurt that everyone experiences during puberty is the consequence of growth hormone. As all of us age, when we go from adolescence to our teenage years and then into young adulthood, but then starting in our early 30s or so, the amount of growth hormone that we secrete is greatly diminished. Normally, we would release growth hormone every night. Low blood sugar, turns out, is a stimulus for growth hormone release. And I don't mean hypoglycemia of the sort that makes you dizzy and want to pass out. That's bad. I mean, not having high levels of glucose and insulin in your bloodstream. This is one of the reasons why many people are drawn to intermittent fasting or even prolonged fasting. It's because of the reported increases in growth hormone. Certain forms of exercise have also been shown to stimulate growth hormone release which for people in their 30s, 40s, and beyond could be very useful and may also be useful for people who are just trying to stimulate the release of more growth hormone in order to, for instance, recover from exercise or stimulate fat loss or muscle growth or repair of a particular injury. So let me describe what they did in this study. They used an 80 degree Celsius environment. So that's 176 degrees Fahrenheit. And they had subjects do this sauna for 30 minutes, four times per day. So that's two hours total in one day, 30 minutes in the sauna, a period of cool down rest, 30 minutes in the sauna again, cool down rest, a third and a fourth time. So they had subjects do this protocol. And I should mention they had both male and female subjects in this study. And the entire study lasted a week. They did this two hours of sauna exposure on day one, day three, and day seven of that week. And they measured a lot of different hormones, cortisol, thyroid stimulating hormone, thyroid hormone itself, luteinizing hormone, and follicle stimulating hormone, which are hormones that essentially drive the production of other hormones. They looked at prolactin and they looked at growth hormone. In subjects that did this two hour a day, 80 degree Celsius protocol, experienced 16 fold increases in growth hormone. So they measured growth hormone before the sauna and after the sauna and growth hormone levels went up 16 fold, which is obviously an enormous and it turns out statistically significant effect. the effects of sauna exposure on growth hormone actually went down the more often that people did this deliberate heat exposure. On day one, there was a 16-fold increase in growth hormone. On day three, however, there was still a significant effect on growth hormone as compared to before sauna, okay? So now instead of getting a 16-fold increase, it was more like a three or four-fold increase, which is still a huge increase, but not as great as the increase observed on day one. And then on day seven, there tended to be a two, maybe a threefold increase. The reason this happens is because heat, just like cold, is a shock or a stressor to the system. In the context of cold, if you get into a very cold ice bath, for instance, a five degree ice bath, even for 20 seconds, it's known to increase norepinephrine 200%. It can double the amount of norepinephrine that you suddenly release into your brain and body, which actually can have some positive effect. But if you were to do that every day, you would become cold adapted. This circuit that compares the shell and core of your body would adjust in ways that it could either predict that cold stimulus or more likely to create some thermogenic mechanisms in preparation for that cold exposure.
But the fact that that result diminished over time either means that the circuit was not as efficient in communicating that shift in temperature or that that shift in temperature was of less impact because the downstream effectors were not engaged to the same extent because it wasn't as much of a shock. And I think the latter explanation is far more likely. Annotated and summarized. Easy to share with loved ones. The description below the title for this video has these summary points.